Good evening and welcome to the Global Advancements in Bladder Cancer course. We strive to offer outstanding educational courses and greatly appreciate your evaluations and general feedback so that we are able to continuously improve our programs. The AUA is accredited by the ACCME and designates this activity for a maximum of 1.5 AMA PRA Category 1 credits. Evaluations are very important to us. Course evaluations and CME credit will be administered electronically on the AUA University immediately following the program today. As the AUA continues to develop virtual education that meets your needs, we welcome your feedback regarding both the content and format of this activity. Please visit auau.auanet.org to complete your evaluation and credit claim. All persons in a position to control the content of an AUA educational activity are required to disclose any relevant financial relationships with any commercial interest please visit auau.auanet.org to view faculty, education council, and COI review workgroup disclosures. The AUA would like to thank AstraZeneca for providing an independent educational grant to support this activity. This activity is meant to be educational in nature and in some instances reflects the opinion of the presenters. The information does not guarantee accuracy of claims submitted. Please verify the accuracy of individual medical claims submitted and please follow individual insurer's rules. Finally, I'd like to extend a special thanks to our course director, Dr. Cheryl Lee, for her time, talent, and expertise in developing this program and keeping it relevant with the many advances. Thank you as well to our distinguished faculty for participating in the course. Well, good evening. I'm Cheryl Lee, I'm chair of the Department of Urology at The Ohio State University, and I'm really pleased to be your course moderator uh, this evening. This 90 minute course is going to address new and emerging treatment options for non-muscle invasive disease and some for uh, muscle invasive bladder cancer. Our focus is going to be on some of the side effects and interventions of these new agents, and we're also planning to review guidelines specific to first and second line therapies, uh, particularly for non-muscle invasive disease. We'll also be discussing the timing and usage of neoadjuvant and adjuvant systemic therapy for muscle invasive disease. We'll touch on the BCG shortage and how that impacts our treatment of patients. And lastly, we'll think a little bit about the urologist's role in clinical trial enrollment. Um, so what we're going to do now is take a look at our learning objectives. So these are the learning objectives for our case-based course today. You'll be able to see these on uh, AUA University um, and we'll be covering this over uh, a series of several courses today, several cases today. Now I'm pleased to introduce our outstanding faculty, uh, Dr. Max Cates from Johns Hopkins University, Dr. Bogdana Schmidt from the University of Utah, and Dr. Debashis Sundi from the Ohio State University. Welcome. Well, let's get started. Segment one of our uh, case grouping is going to deal with risk stratification of non-muscle invasive disease. Um, we know that for muscle invasive disease, risk stratification, stratification is really based on cancer stage, histology, uh, and perhaps even uh, ctDNA, which we'll talk a little bit about later. But we're gonna focus on non-muscle invasive disease uh, right now with our first case. So in our first case, we have a 72-year-old man who develops gross hematuria. 
a bladder mass is seen on CT urogram, and you can see that off uh, to the side. Um, he does undergo a TURBT, and you can see kind of the cystoscopic image of that uh, tumor there in the lower image. That reveals a 1.5 centimeter high grade non invasive bladder cancer with associated carcinoma and situ. Dr. Schmidt, how do you restratify your patients with non muscle invasive bladder cancer? And in particular, how would you classify this patient's risk? So I like the AUA risk stratification. I think it makes things relatively simple. And it was designed to create broad categories to help with treatment and for counseling decisions. So it hasn't been validated to predict recurrence or progression. I think it's very useful to help counsel patients. So low risk is what you think it would be. It's your solitary low risk lesion or a pun lump. Intermediate risk is, oh yeah, that's great. You can get that as one up from that. Um, yeah. So solitary, but large low-grade lesions or multifocal low-grade lesions or the or rare uh, low-grade T1 lesion and your small high-grade TAs. Anything more than that or a combination of those is high risk. So any CIS or prostatic urethral involvement, any variant histology or combination thereof is a high risk. Also, any BCG failure is a high risk. So this patient has a small high-grade TA and CIS, which makes him high risk. And if you use the URTC calculator, he has a primary high-grade solitary tumor that's under three centimeters and CIS. So his progression risk is probably about 10% at five years without any additional treatment. Dr. Cates, suppose this patient didn't have carcinoma in situ, how would that change his risk stratification? And as we're thinking about that, should all intermediate risk patients be managed the same way? That's a great question, Dr. Lee. So as we know, there are so many different patients that go into this category, this broad category that's intermediate risk disease. And Efforts by various groups, for example, the International Bladder Cancer Group, among others, have really sought to further stratify this heterogeneous population of patients. Essentially, it really comes down to trying to stratify who should receive BCG, which would typically be those high-grade uh, non-invasive uh, intermediate risk cancers that are on the larger side of the intermediate intermediate risk group. So maybe those two, three centimeters high grade non-invasive cancers versus uh, those intermediate risk patients that have, say, a, a single uh, recurrent low grade lesion that maybe should be receiving in, uh, intravascular chemotherapy. So this is uh, a major effort that that's ongoing uh, and um, and one we'll, we'll be looking to in the future. That's quite interesting. Um, Dr. Sundy, what, what would be your approach to treatment and surveillance of our original patient? So the patient that was high risk um, rather than the uh, the patient we were just we just posed to Dr. Cates, which was intermediate risk. Thanks for the question. Uh, it's an important one. High risk non muscle invasive bladder cancer, of course, affects many people. And um, you know, I think the the and and you know, there's many components to this this question. First of all, I'll, I'll say that probably the treatment approach I would favor is um, intravesical BCG immunotherapy. Um, and, and specifically, uh, with a full six week induction course and, um, three week maintenance treatments, uh, up to month 36, uh, as specified in the SWOG 8507 protocol. Um, surveillance, um, for this type of patient, uh, is, is essential. Obviously, even with BCG, uh, recurrences are, are, uh, relatively common. Um, and so here, um, I think it's reasonable to um, perform cystoscopy um, and obtain a urine cytology um, at three-month intervals for the first two years after diagnosis. Um, 
generally I'll move to every six months in years three and four, and then uh, annually thereafter. Um, the, you know, of course, if you see a tumor uh, visually on, on cystoscopy, you know, it's pretty uh, straightforward what you need to do, obviously, get a biopsy, uh, whether it's under anesthesia or not. Uh, cytology introduces some, you know, complication, you know, I will say um, it may benefit you to kind of have a relationship with or at least understanding how your cytopathologist at your hospital makes calls. There's positive and there's negative and there's atypical. What does that mean? Uh, atypical might mean negative, atypical might mean positive. Um, I think it's reasonable in some cases to try to adjudicate an uh, atypical cytology. Uh, using uh, a Eurovision fish test, for example. Um, and if you do have someone who has a, a patient who has um, a recurrent tumor or someone who has a positive cytology in the absence of a visible tumor, um, don't forget to evaluate your sanctuary sites. And so what I mean by that is by obtaining selective upper tract cytologies of your ureters and remembering to biopsy the prostatic urethra, either by um, resection or, or cold cup biopsies. Uh, you know, I think the final comment I'll, I'll make here is that this is really um, an exciting area um, in terms of um, innovative biomarkers. So um, emerging evidence would suggest that some tests, such as uh, the CX bladder monitor from CX bladder or the UCGP from Convergent Genomics might in the near future be able to help us uh, modulate, so to speak, the frequency with which we subject our patients to cystoscopy. And, and that's important because, um, you know, that constant cystoscopy and surveillance is, is a burden to the patient. And um, I forgot to mention uh, periodic imaging is, is important too. So uh, guidelines would suggest evaluate the upper tracts every one to two years. I do it every two years. Uh, CT urogram is my um, upper tract surveillance imaging modality of choice. Any any other thoughts from the other panelists on this patient? Okay, well, we're going to move on to uh, therapeutics. And let's talk a little bit about first-line therapy for non-muscle invasive disease. We'll be talking a little bit about perioperative uh, uh, systemic agents for muscle invasive disease in, in a few cases. But for now, we're gonna just focus on non-muscle invasive disease. So in this patient, um, we have an otherwise healthy 56-year-old man who also had gross hematuria and um, he's got an isolated two centimeter bladder mass on a CT urogram, as you can see there in the, um, in the image. Uh, Dr. Cates, how, what, can you talk a little bit about how you would approach this patient, um, you know, in terms of his, his general management? Sure. So uh, this is a new bladder mass. So, so this is perhaps the most important part of this patient's bladder cancer journey in that a TURBT has the opportunity to be curative here, is the opportunity to diagnose and stage and treat this tumor. Um, and so by performing a high quality transurethral resection of this bladder tumor, we have the opportunity to really chart this patient's disease journey. Um, so I would fully resect uh, this tumor. I would obtain muscle in the specimen. Um, in my practice, a tumor like this, I, I would give perioperative gemcitabine in the uh, recovery room, uh, knowing that um, uh, SWOG uh, 0337 demonstrated a benefit to giving perioperative intravesical gemcitabine uh, with a 34% cancer recurrence rate in the gem arm versus a 54% uh, recurrence rate in, in the normal saline arm. So a 20 point spread. So that's why it's, it's routine in my practice. And following that, um, I would um, 
you know, uh, follow up the patient's pathology and then go from there. But the, the most important aspect is really that transurethral resection. Well, um, I think we just cannot undervalue the importance of a good TUR. I completely agree with you. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about um, efforts that can help to improve that TUR. But let's say you, you're going in to do the TUR, and this is what you see at the time of Cisto, this, this image here. Um, and I'm just gonna uh, say you're going to do your, uh, your TUR. I've got a small video to show. And while you're resecting, you get an, you, the patient has an obturator jerk. And this is what you experience. Now, um, how would you manage this situation? You've talked already about the importance of perioperative intravesical therapy. Um, how, how are you gonna approach this patient now? Not that any of us have ever had a <laughs> bladder perforation, but you know, what? How would you manage this? So this is a you know an unfortunate uh, scenario, but one that happens uh, uh, you know from time to time, and 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 it's important to to recognize first and foremost that the injury occurred, um, and then I uh, I would uh, perform a cystogram to evaluate the perforation. Um, if there's evidence of intraperitoneal, of a significant intraperitoneal uh, extravasation uh, or leak, I would repair it at that time. Um, if not, I would likely leave a Foley catheter for prolonged uh, bladder drainage. Um, I would not uh, give the patient intravesical chemotherapy. In this scenario, I would worry about uh, both local toxicity by doing that, as well as systemic absorption and systemic toxicity. Well, um, you do all those things. You have your catheter and you've done your cystogram, you had your perforation uh, and, and the patient recovers. Um, a cystogram is performed after the catheter comes out. Things look good, no, no leak. His final pathology is a clinical TA urethelial carcinoma. Now, you obviously did not give the perioperative uh, chemotherapy as we discussed. Would you consider adjuvant intravesical chemotherapy with this pathology? And, and then how often would you survey the patient? So I, I would really view that this is where risk stratification is so important um, as, as discussed by Dr. Schmidt. Really, this is a two centimeter low grade non-invasive tumor. This is a low risk lesion. Uh, and the AUA guidelines that have recently been updated specifically speak to this that I would perform an initial cystoscopy uh, at around four months, three to four months after um, this resection. And if things look good, I would then perform another cystoscopy six to nine months and then annually thereafter. So I, 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 would, uh, I would not, I would de-escalate sort of the traditional uh, intensive surveillance that you might do, for example, for an intermediate risk or a high risk patient um, in this specific scenario. Now it's interesting, um, a lot of patients are really excited to have that relaxed surveillance with cystoscopy. I'm sure you also have the patients who are kind of anxious, right? And they're nervous about going nine months and then uh, uh, annually and then you know stopping the surveillance at five months. Um, how, how does the panel deal, deal with that for patients? Anyone can chime in. I try to tell them that this is a good thing, that this really is indicative of the fact that this cancer is unlikely to kill them, but is more likely a nuisance. And we're trying to decrease how much of a nuisance it is. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I personally let patients know they've graduated to the relaxed surveillance. And so uh, really try to foster, foster that and support the relaxed surveillance for these uh, lower risk patients. Okay, so the patient actually does opt for observation. And 12 months later, he has a recurrent, a smaller tumor, 1.5 to two centimeters. It's non-invasive. Uh, it's on a stalk and seen on surveillance cystoscopy. 
A CT urogram just reveals a left bladder filling defect. Um, Dr. Sundy, how would you approach this patient at this time? Well, um, you know, first, uh, firstly, uh, of course, you're, you, you'll uh, plan on proceeding to the operating room for, for a TRBT and, and devil's in the details. So um, what exactly are you dealing with? And, um, you know, what will be the nuances of your approach? You know, I think in um, in our field, there's a, a cognitive association which can mislead us sometimes that something that looks low grade is low risk, right? And we've talked about this a number of times already with, with what Dr. Schmidt has brought up and what Dr. Cates discussed. Um, but of course, a low grade TA tumor or low grade non-invasive tumor as this tumor appears to be based on flexible cystoscopy um, may be a bit higher risk. In fact, this has recurred within 12 months. Um, this is uh, likely an intermediate risk tumor. So that's, you know, kind of what you're thinking going in. Um, and, and let's talk again about the, the SWOG 0337 trial. Okay, you know, you're patting yourself on the back. I think I've recognized an intermediate risk tumor. I think that uh, Dr. Messing's trial, SO337, was for low risk non ulcerative invasive bladder cancer. Maybe I shouldn't do gemcitabine. Um, and that's that's where this things can get tricky. Um, so if if you were to look at you know the the baseline characteristics table of the SO337 trial, you'll recognize that actually a lot of the patients who were evaluated were of intermediate risk. And that's really, I think, the beauty and power of, of this prospective um, study. Um, I think um, you know about a third of patients had recurrent tumors. Um, Two thirds of patients had multifocal tumors. So really, um, you know, wonderful study that applies to low risk but also intermediate risk bladder cancer. And for that reason, even in this patient who now likely has intermediate risk disease, non muscle invasive disease at least, I think there's definitely a role for uh, perioperative uh, gemcitabine uh, in the bladder. Well, um, at the time of TUR, you you're looking at this tumor here in the image, and it is on a stock. And I'm, I'm wondering about your thoughts on end block resection. We're hearing more about that and just trying to provide a better specimen uh, to the pathologist, trying to resect the tumor and block so we really have a clear understanding of the local extent of disease. Are, are you using that in your practice? Great question. I think unblocked TRBT is a wonderful concept. Uh, I use it sometimes. Um, you know, not every tumor will be amenable to an unblocked approach. Uh, and of course, it depends on what type of instrument you're using. Um, you know, I, I, I use, uh, you know, conventional loop. Um, and so that means, you know, probably the smaller tumors will be conventional, uh, uh, you know, amenable to unblocked resection. Others will use uh, hydro dissection. You know, that's not available in my hospital. Uh, others will use uh, different types of lasers, holmium or, or thulium lasers, which are commonly available. Uh, you know, I think um, the, you know, a number of attractive points about unblocked TRBT or, or bladder tumor removal um, as supported in a number of prospective trials actually is that it may be associated with an increased duration of recurrence-free survival. It has been observed, it's not universal. Um, and it appears to be as safe as a conventional TURBT, so that's good. Uh, and, and one of the biggest um, um, beneficiaries, in addition to you know, the patient here, is also gonna be your pathologist. They will have excellent specimen orientation. Uh, perhaps there will be less of uh, wondering whether that, that muscle bundle that was observed is muscularis propria or something else. Um, it has been observed in prospective studies that uh, the rate of the ability of the pathologist to uh, perform T1 substaging is increased uh, with uh, non-block technique. Um, and I think in, in the largest study, uh, we know at least it's, it's non-inferior with respect to oncologic outcomes and safety. So if you can do it, I, I strongly encourage it. And it's possible with a number of tools. And here's an example of, of that. Uh, end block resection near the UO. There's a nice stalk there. 
So this, this uh, after the TUR, the pathology reveals a low grade TA tumor. And it, and it that's pretty consistent with what it looks like, non-invasive. Um, what's your treatment choice for intermediate risk disease and, and how would you now treat this patient specifically? You kind of alluded to some of this just, just a little bit ago. Well, at this point, you know, the, you know uh, by the time you've re you're reviewing the pathology report, of course, you've given the patient uh, the perioperative gem cytobine. Um, and, you know, I will say that for patients with intermediate risk disease, uh, my decision for ongoing therapy um, is determined by how many individual risk factors they, they have. So, um, you know, on the slide that you're looking at, um, are, are you know both the AUA and uh, EAU um, criteria for, for intermediate risk disease. And of course, there's some, some debate there. Um, I, I tend to uh, um, enumerate uh, risk factors though. So the clinical risk factors that I'm referring to are a tumor size, three centimeters or greater, a recurrent bladder tumor, uh, or a tumor that recurs frequently. And so um, if a patient has all three uh, or more risk factors, um, I think a, a helpful um, a guide for me is uh, a publication from Kamat and colleagues from the Journal of Urology in 2014, who suggest that multiple risk factors in intermediate risk disease, clinical risk factors, size, uh, multifocality, um, recurrences, early recurrences, those are factors that may make you want to consider uh, treating a tumor as, as a high-risk tumor. On the other hand, if your intermediate risk patient uh, has none of the clinical risk factors by size recurrences or multifocality, then perhaps that patient doesn't need any uh, further intravesical treatment. In this specific case, the patient um, with uh, intermediate risk disease um, did have a, a recurrence within 12 months there is a clinical risk factor there. I think it's reasonable to discuss um, gemcitabine, maintenance gemcitabine, induction and maintenance gemcitabine in the bladder for a full year with a patient. Not everyone will buy into it. Of course, there's, um, again, think of the patient perspective, um, the visits, the cost, potential side effects, but I think, do think it's worthwhile to discuss gemcitabine for a year. Well, our patient um, actually does well uh, after uh, getting some adjuvant therapy, he unfortunately develops a recurrence 15 months later. TURBT is again performed. He has several um, non-invasive appearing tumors. Pathology reveals high-grade clinical TA in several of these tumors, but they're all smaller, less than two centimeters. Um, there's muscularis propria in three of seven specimen, but all the specimen have lamina propria. So they're all non-invasive on pathology. They've all got lamina propria, but only three have muscularis propria. I think we, a number of us find ourselves in this situation with some of these smaller tumors. A recent CT urogram is negative. Dr. Schmidt, how, how do you manage or counsel the patient now looking at that pathology? You know, should we be getting muscle in every specimen of every non-invasive tumor? Well, just for a second, I want to come back to risk stratification here. So this patient has a recurrence and has multiple high-grade TA tumors. So while previously, as Dr. Sundy discussed, I agree this patient was intermediate risk. Now I think this patient is high risk. And I think that's important to keep in mind for the overall framing of the patient. Coming back to um, this particular case on the muscle, when all the tumors are visible, there's no CIS anywhere, multiple small tumors. I probably would not do a re-resection to look for muscle in every single one. I think if the lamina propria is clear in all the lesions, the risk of upstaging on re-resection is probably fairly low. And as long as I felt that I got all of the tumors and didn't miss anything, I would trust this pathology, but if there was CIS, if the tumors were larger, if any one of the individual tumors was greater than three centimeters, and I thought maybe I didn't get it all, then I would consider a resection for sure. Um, 
It sounds like you're leaning towards treatment, you know, with, with BCG. Um, it can be challenging to know how much BCG you give and how long. So I'm curious about your approach to certainly induction, but, but the maintenance schedule in someone like this. Yeah, well, my, my favorite BCG trivia in general is that uh, the six week induction course, the fact that that wasn't based on any evidence, it was just based on the fact that Dr. Morales got six separate files shipped to him when he was doing initial treatments. And so that's where the six weeks comes from. So induction is, there's no, no debate, it's only six weeks. But for maintenance, um, we think about either one year of maintenance or three years of maintenance per, per the SWAP protocol. And when you look at, thank you for pulling up that slide, ERTC 30962, looking at using full dose BCG or one third dose BCG with one year or three years, we learned in, in this trial that only difference that was significant was one third dose for one year is not as good as full dose for three years. So in a perfect world, I would like to do for intermediate risk patients, full dose for one year and full dose for three years for my high risk patients. But obviously in the time of BCG shortages, we don't always have those luxuries. So it's nice to have this data to be able to fine tune our, our ability to provide good care for patients. Well, speaking of BCG shortage, I think this has really affected um, so many of us across the country and the world. Uh, and we really had to to rethink uh, our management to some, some degree. At the same time, um, we've kind of been rethinking our definitions for BCG failure and ha have actually uh, thought more about the patients who have the highest risk of disease across all of our uh, prior categories of BCG failure, be it BCG refractory disease, unresponsive disease, or recurrent disease, or relapsing disease. So this definition of BCG unresponsive of, of diseases is really uh, something that's become very important in the field and, and really triggered the design of clinical trials. So I thought this is a great uh, segment for us to consider a patient. So we have uh, our third patient who is a 76 year old gentleman diagnosed with carcinoma in situ of the bladder after a workup for irritate avoiding. Uh, imaging is negative, and his regional urologist recommends BCG, but has no access to the medication due to the BCG shortage. Uh, Dr. Sundy, how have you been affected by the BCG shortage, and how have you managed high-risk patients? Um, and for that matter, how, how have you managed intermediate-risk patients in, in this context? That's, that's a great question, uh, very topical. Um, the worldwide BCG shortage continues. Um, and, you know, I have been affected by the BCG shortage at, at multiple times. At the moment, at our hospital, uh, we do have plenty of BCG. Um, you know, I, I don't think Merck directly determines um, which medical centers get BCG. I think there's some uh, distributor uh, or warehouse network that that figures that out, but you know, so one hospital's adequate BCG supply um, might change. It's, it's it's not a definite. Um, and you know, these difficulties are related to um, the fact that it's it's not completely straightforward to make BCG. Remember, it's a living bacteria. You have to grow it. It takes several months to produce a batch. Right now, there's only one company, Merck, uh, who produces it, um, and and you know, they have committed to um, maxing out their current production facility and, and building another production facility that might be online um, in, in a couple of years. So I, I hope that our, our patients with bladder cancer will, will have a more reliable access to BCG in the future, but that's the reality of today. So what do you do if you have a BCG shortage in a patient with high risk or let's say even intermediate risk uh, um, bladder cancer? Uh, the strategy I have gone to um, which uh, has been endorsed uh, by the AUA and SUO uh, and Beacon among a number of organizations, as, as you've shown um, on the slide in front, front of us right now, is that uh, you can consider shorten the total duration of BCG treatment from three years to one year in certain cases. 
uh, or dose reducing from full dose to half one half dose or perhaps what what you know I'm personally more used to is 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 one third one third dose. There's a little bit of coordination that that goes on there. Ideally, if you're um, using one third of a vial of BCG per patient, then hopefully you can batch your patients so that that vial is truly getting used for three patients. So you need to have a, a, a high volume uh, um, or moderate volume practice, I would say. Um, where you really have to think about um, risk stratification uh, or substratifying risk is, is I think in your high risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer patients who have T1 disease who are at very high risk for progression. And I think uh, those patients um, really do deserve uh, full dose BCG for three years. Um, and Dr. Schmidt highlighted why just moments ago. What about intermediate risk disease? Um, if, you know, I, I, I think that that's, uh, that's a bit of a gray, gray area. Um, if you, if you do have a, a stringent BCG shortage, it's something to consider, uh, especially if, if your patient has, you know, let's say four risk factors and they're recurring all the time. Um, but I would also consider intravesical chemotherapy uh, for the patient with uh, intermediate risk bladder cancer who is dirt deserving of adjuvant intravesical therapy. Yeah, I think that's what many of us have, have had to do. And, um, and particularly for the low intermediate risk, uh, I mean, that, that's always been my standard practice. So I think really exploiting intravesical chemotherapy is a great option there. So this yeah. Oh, sorry. And, and, I mean, I think there's, uh, you know, there's a little bit more hope on the horizon too. It's we're not just dependent on one company or their production facilities, right? So this is where you know some of the innovation in the field has come to play. Um, you know, there's a, a trial uh, reported out in 2014 um, by Wrench et al. that suggested that um, the Connaught strain of, of BCG um, was you know, maybe more oncologically effective than, than the Tice BCG strain, which is what we have now. And, and um, you know, there's a Tokyo BCG strain as well, and, and uh, the SWOGS 1602 uh, clinical trial uh, that a number of us have participated in is evaluating whether um, a Tokyo BCG strain, um, uh, how the oncologic efficacy of a Tokyo BCG, str BCG strain will compare to the Tice BCG as compared to um, intradermal vaccination with Tokyo BCG followed by intravesical BCG. So this sort of innovation may make a different BCG strain, um, encourage the availability of a different, different BCG strain, which would further alleviate our shortage. Well, this patient does go on to have full induction. He, luckily he came someplace and there's a good deal of BCG available and maintenance BCG dosing, but he does recur um, late in his maintenance BCG treatment out to 30 months he got before he had a recurrence. He had some bladder erythema on surveillance cystoscopy, a cytology showed some dysplasia, although uh, probably the grading system has gotten away from that term, but uh, suspicious in, in many ways would, would be another way to put that. And a urinary uh, reflexed fish, fluorescence in situ hybridization is positive. He's got a CT urogram, that reveals no upper tract uh, or uh, metastatic disease. Uh, Dr. Schmidt, how are we defining BCG failure? This, this patient's been on it for 30 months and now has had potentially a recurrence, uh, possibly of CIS. Well, certainly for this particular patient, I would take them to the operating room and find out what is going on and confirm that it is indeed CIS or what, what else is happening. But the, the terms BCG failures and BCG unresponsive, it's, it's pretty confusing and there are a lot of these terms. So I wanna try and break it down a little bit and make it simpler if I can. And to first just define the unresponsiveness of it, you have to make sure that the patient got adequate treatment to be deemed unresponsive. So that means at least five of six induction doses of BCG and at least two of the three maintenance doses if the patient had a maintenance cycle or uh, two of six doses of a section second induction course of BCG if they were reinduced. 
And then there are several additional definitions. So relapsing is any time patients on maintenance and they have a high-grade tumor after that, or refractories when you have high-grade tumor or CIS after reinduction or maintenance. And both of these kind of comprise the unresponsive category. But I think simplifying this a little bit and just thinking of it as a BCG failure is helpful. So ultimately, if any patient develops a T1 tumor at your first look in, usually that's at your three months look, that's a BCG failure. If they have a TA at six months, that's a BCG failure. And if they have any CIS within 12 months, that's a BCG failure. And that is the new definition that the FDA is now looking at and kind of defining for patients who are trying to do trials for patients who have this unresponsive disease where indeed they had failed BCG and were looking for additional options. Well, that's a great lead in to our next case, which is dealing with some of the um, newer therapies that are used to treat patients who are BCG unresponsive. And to illustrate this, I, I want to um, discuss a case. This is a patient of mine. It's a real patient. <laughs> Um, and it, and it uh, speaks to some of the challenges we face. Is a, a very nice 71-year-old gentleman who was diagnosed with um, high-grade T1 bladder cancer after a workup for microhematuria and a UTI back in September of 2018. And um, you know he had a TUR that revealed a high-rate, like I said, a high-grade T1 tumor. And then he came to see me. I recommended. Uh, that he have a restaging TUR, and that was in January of 2019. And uh, he had some residual high-grade uh, T1 disease at the time of that restaging uh, TUR. Muscularis propria was negative. He, he's very, very committed to bladder preservation, as you'll see. Ultimately, uh, we went, we moved forward with an induction course of BCG, and Really soon thereafter, he had another recurrence of high-grade TA and CIS. So we never got a chance to even get to maintenance. Um, so we resected that, that disease uh, and, and we uh, talked again about uh, therapeutic options and opted for a second course of, of induction course of BCG. Um, you know, it, it wasn't long again uh, that he unfortunately uh, again, didn't get to maintenance, had a recurrence and a high grade T1. So now we've got recurrent T1 after two, um, you know, two uh, induction courses of BCG. And, you know, this, this gentleman is, is BCG unresponsive. He's refusing cystectomy. Uh, Dr. Cates, you know, gemcitabine and docetaxel have become pretty popular. And many of us have used it, um, you know, off label for for treating patients with BCG unresponsive disease. If you could discuss the use of gemcitabine and docetaxel in this, in this kind of setting in, in this space, and I'll help you with a couple slides I know that we had uh, ahead of time. Sure, uh, thank you for, for that question. So. Gemcitabine and, and docetaxel, they're, they're two generic chemotherapies that have been used for, at this point, more than a generation. Um, now, what's their relevance for intravesical uh, therapy for high-risk bladder, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer? Well, Mike O'Donnell, more than 10 years ago, uh, really, really uh, sort of paved the way in delivering this uh, therapy starting in BCG unresponsive patients. Um, and, and today it's utilized in many centers uh, really across North America. This was a, uh, a survey of members of the Society of Urologic Oncology uh, evaluating what percent were using it in their practice. And, and this survey was three or four years ago. Um, so it could be even more patients at this point. But already at that point, 66% of respondents um, were utilizing this combination now called gem dosi, um, other people call it different things, uh, for BCG unresponsive, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. Um, and, um, and, and I think that tracks with what we're seeing across communities. Um, and, and at that point, um, 
uh, really even uh, a quarter of patients were utilizing it for BCG naive uh, bladder cancer. And that was because this survey was, was given during the BCG shortage. And so speaking about the BCG shortage that we had discussed, this, this was being utilized at, at many centers during the BCG shortage when BCG was not available. Um, and, and so when you look at the data for BCG unresponsive disease, unfortunately, we do not have prospective uh, uh, trials uh, to inform that data. Um, the retrospective uh, data uh, does look quite well. Uh, uh, does look quite good, especially when compared to some of the, the trials. But once again, that's apples and oranges, and I would not compare those. But the retrospective data does show a 12-month uh, CR, 12-month complete response rate for CIS patients of 60%. Um, and, uh, and so uh, I'm uh, quite optimistic in, in using this drug combination for patients who have BCG unresponsive disease. And I, when I counsel them, I do discuss that there is not uh, prospective trial data for this specific BCG unresponsive population, um, but that it is a promising alternative to radical cystectomy um, for patients who do desire to preserve their bladders. Well, going, going back to our patient, he did actually opt to have gemcitabine and docetaxel. And uh, again, he's very very committed to bladder preservation. Um, and we tried to really maximize his use with uh, maintenance therapy out to a year. Uh, unfortunately, he recurred uh, again, um, but we probably had a good year and a half or so in between his maintenance. Uh, well, you know, the, the entire period of maintenance, but once he got off maintenance, he recurred uh, with just some uh, small volume disease. He had minute early uh, non-invasive papillary urothelial carcinoma that was high grade, and he had a small focus of carcinoma in situ, and his prosthetic urethra was negative. You know, at that time, um, we talked about a, a number of things. We uh, re-approached the discussion of cystectomy, but he had pretty, a pretty low volume recurrence. So at, at that time, we actually talked about a clinical trial with erdafitinib. Um, he did not have an FGFR mutation, so he was not eligible, though he had been very interested in that trial. Um, ultimately, he opted to have uh, mitomycin C. We didn't have another trial at that moment available for him, but he underwent uh, mitomycin C, and as you might imagine, recurred not, not that long uh, later. And at that point, he had carcinoma in situ. Um, so we're, you know, you're you're seeing this this you know kind of continuing recurrence of of high grade disease, um, and he continues to refuse cystectomy. You know, we had some discussions about the use of pembrolizumab. Um, it was around this time, I believe, that it was FDA approved or had been approved a few months before. Uh, I think it's worthwhile for us to talk about this with, with the audience. Dr. Sunday, can you discuss um, the use of pembrolizumab in this setting of BCG unresponsive disease? Thank you, that, that, that's a really important question. Uh, overall, you know, I, I think it's great for patients, great for urologists that pembrolizumab, uh, intravenous pembroliz pembrolizumab is an option for patients with uh, BCG unresponsive uh, non-muscle invasive disease. And, you know, I will say that in general, in, in, in across the spectrum of bladder cancer and, and you know, more, particularly more advanced bladder cancers, uh, you know, there's a really great deal of enthusiasm for, for pembrolizumab uh, when you think of patients who uh, progress um, after cisplatin chemotherapy, for example, uh, for, for increasing overall survival. What is pembrolizumab? It, it's an immune checkpoint inhibitor. Um, so in front of you uh, is a, a cartoon uh, that I created on BioRender uh, that, that shows a very simple uh, interaction of a cancer cell and an immune cell, the CD8 positive T cell. And uh, the, the, the you know, kind of basic story here is the CD8 positive T cell has the potential to kill the cancer cell. It's a cytotoxic immune cell. Uh, 
And that depends on the CDAT cell uh, recognizing uh, um, cell presented uh, tumor neoantigen uh, with its uh, receptor. There are checkpoint inhibitors, uh, excuse me, there are immune checkpoints in uh, immune cells. And the example here is that yellow molecule in the middle diagram, which is labeled PD-1. So if this immune checkpoint is activated by the PDL1 molecule that might be expressed on the uh, cancer cell or let's say an antigen presenting cell, that can lead the uh, cytotoxic immune cell to lose function. It might become exhausted. It might not release its uh, perforins and granzymes and, and uh, interferons that help it uh, control the cancer cells. So the idea behind uh, pembrolizumab and similar immune checkpoint inhibitors uh, that's represented in the blue, um, uh, represents a blue colored antibody on the rightmost part of the diagram, is that the immune checkpoint inhibitor may um, interrupt the interaction of, in this case, the PDL1 and PD1 immune checkpoint, therefore uninhibiting uh, this T cell from its cytotoxic function. So that's the principle. It's great. But I, I should also say that in the spectrum of, of, um, Management options for patients with BCG unresponsive bladder cancer. In this specific context, I actually don't have a lot of enthusiasm for pembrolizumab, and and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, it generally has, um, uh, you know, a, a relatively unfavorable um, cost to benefit ratio and relatively unfavorable side effect to benefit ratio. And there may be a slide that indicates this, but. Um, you know, in general, uh, we know um, um, based on prospective data that there's a 19% complete response rate uh, with pembrolizumab for patients with um, CIS containing BCG unresponsive disease. Yet there's a 13% uh, grade three to five serious adverse event rate. And it's really expensive um, over, you know, over $10,000, nearly $20,000. And, and there's that, that slide that, that shows the oncologic efficacy um, as, as well as you know, some of the toxicity. So if you think about um, you know, the cons, you know, they're, they're, you know, I think a lot of us hesitate to prescribe pembrolizumab as a first line option for people with BCG unresponsive disease. Um, and so a lot of us uh, favor gemcitabine and docetaxel. Uh, if our, if your center has a clinical trial, I'm, I'm sure you 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 know you will enthusiastically screen your, your patient with BCG unresponsive disease for a clinical trial. You'll talk about cystectomy. The reality of the situation, though, um, is that once in a while you'll find a patient like Dr. Lee's where bladder preservation is the goal, and you've run out of all options. And in that setting, pembrolizumab is a really valuable option. Well, we'll get back to my patient. You know, we actually tried to uh, get him enrolled in a trial we had um, with pembrolizumab, but he had a few challenges with the trial, having to repeat some imaging, having to repeat a TUR because of the timeliness of, of the timing of some of the, um, you know, the interventions. So ultimately, we just decided to treat him because uh, the drug was was FDA approved at that point. So we, we did, he actually did receive treatment with pembrolizumab. And as you can see, um, unfortunately, he did uh, suffer yet another recurrence. Um, Dr. Schmidt, help me. What, what, what should I be doing with, with this patient? Do I, do I have other, other options? <laughs> He's refusing cystectomy still. Very nice gentleman. Maybe you can talk talk to us a little bit about natafaragine furidenovic. Well, unfortunately, I don't know that we could have gotten it for your patient right around then, but natafaragine furidenovic is actually really exciting because I agree with Dr. Sundy. There are a lot of drawbacks to pembrolizumab, the cost, the side effects, and the fact that it's an IV medication that has its own host of systemic issues to deal with. Um, Natafaragine ferodenovac is a non-replicating recombinant adenovirus vector. 
that is intravesically administered, and it contains a human interferon alpha 2B gene that's bound along to the SYN3, which allows the viral vector into the cells, prevents it from baking down in the bladder, and it's then transported into the nucleus to make the interferon 2B protein that is replicated and released locally in the bladder. So that is a unique feature of this treatment, that it is administered into the bladder, has all of its effects in the bladder, and because of this local replication, it's administered every three months, unlike our every six weeks BCG or, or Gemdosi, this is a once in three months treatment. Um, the FDA approval of this was based off of uh, 157 patients who were in responsive, high-risk BCG and responsive patients, and broken down into CIS and plus or minus papillary disease. And of the patients with papillary disease, 73% had a CR at three months, which sounds great, but 54 of them, 54%, excuse me, of those with CIS had a CR in that time. So a little bit better in papillary. And by 12 months, the durability was also better in the papillary group, but 46% of those who responded initially with CIS still had that CR by 12 months. Of the whole group, only five patients progressed to muscle invasive uh, bladder cancer. And of those, three had high grade T1 disease at diagnosis. So your CIS TA patients did, did quite well. Um, and like I said, the patients with the papillary disease had maintained their uh, durability, their complete response up to 60% of the time by 12 months. And it was really well tolerated. So there were no grade four or five adverse events. And most of the grade three events were discharge around the catheter after installation, fatigue, and some urinary frequency and urgency. 34% of patients required dose interruptions, but less than 10% of those had to do with toxicities uh, related to the treatment. So the dose interruptions had to do more with scheduling of patients rather than treatment related things. So unfortunately though, even though it was FDA approved in December of 2022, it's still not clinically available for patients. So not only was it not available for your patient then, it's not available for my patients now today either quite yet. So I can't help you yet. Well, speaking of which, we, we did actually uh, think about Netaferogene for Denovic and it was unavailable. Um, and of course, all trials were, were closed um, so we wound up with Velrubicin, um, which I just saw him on Tuesday and scoped him. I didn't see anything in the bladder. We'll see what the cytology shows. But anyway, um, we, we continue. So this has been, you know, kind of a five, five year period. But I think we all have these kinds of patients. And the bottom line is here, I think in our field, we can see uh, an increasing number of, of agents to you. So we have you know, not only a second line therapy, but a third and a fourth and, and perhaps more. So uh, exciting time for, for patients. Well, um, why don't we uh, think about, um, you know, I think the intravesical uh, option, gemcitabine and, and docetaxel, um, you know, in the context of BCGN responsive disease, we're seeing this really provocative data it's, it's retrospective. Um, we also are faced with challenges with BCG, right? Uh, inaccessibility, uh, intolerance at times, and then of course, not everybody is going to respond. Um, Dr. Cates, is there a role for gemcitabine and docetaxel in BCG naive patients? That, that's a great question, Dr. Lee. So, so as we've discussed, the the need, the unmet need for an alternative to BCG is is profound. Uh, groups, uh, particularly the group from Iowa, have actually looked at uh, BCG uh, uh, gemdosi for BCG naive non-muscle invasive bladder cancer and found twelve month. Uh, recurrence-free survival of 85% in a retrospective fashion. At, at uh, Johns Hopkins, we performed an investigator-initiated trial um, 
of a single arm, 26 patients um, for BCG naive, non muscle invasive bladder cancer, giving them gemcitabine and docetaxel. And uh, thus far, with more than half have met, having met their 12 month uh, endpoint, we're finding similar uh, results of a 12 month uh, CR of, of around 82%. Um, so there's there's a lot of promise there. And, and based on uh, some of this both retrospective and, and our investigator initiated trial, um, a uh, new uh, uh, phase three randomized controlled trial called the Bridge uh, trial has recently opened. Uh, it opened in February of this of this year, the first patient enrolled, and it is randomizing 870 patients. Uh, to intravesical gemcitabine versus BCG um, with the primary endpoint of event-free survival, which is essentially a uh, recurrence of cancer, cystectomy, or death, whichever comes first. And so um, we really are, are hoping that uh, we'll find alternatives to BCG, given everything we've talked about today. And one way to get there is by generating data. So, so by uh, enrolling patients in a randomized trials like this. That's really exciting. We, we've opened it at the Ohio State University, looking forward to putting patients on. Well, I think we're going to uh, move on to muscle invasive disease. And I have a, a patient that's a little bit unusual in that um, a 72 year old woman who initially had urinary incontinence and she had undergone a, a retropubic sling um, had an incidentally detected low grade uh, clinical TA uh, tumor. Now we never had a chance to review that path, but um, when uh, apparently uh, she later had a recurrence of her tumor after her TUR and had a, a high grade invasive tumor, which is pretty unusual uh, with someone uh, starting with a, a low grade clinical TA tumor. Uh, those tumors have, uh, you know, two or 3% risk of uh, progression of, of, of stage progression. But this patient also had focal micropapillary disease. And again, unfortunately, we did not have access to these slides to um, reevaluate them with our pathologist, although it's clearly very important, particularly with any variant histology. She wound up having a restaging TUR, uh, didn't have any residual disease, but also didn't have um, didn't have any intravesical therapy. So this is a, again a, an unusual patient. Um, she had a recurrence of her high grade clinical T1 disease, and that's when I met her. Uh, she came to OSU for a consultation. We really wanted to reassess things. She had just had this recurrence. We took her for a, a, a restaging TUR. You see her path and her imaging there. Um, and, and unfortunately, she had a muscle invasive tumor with nested features. So again, I don't know how accurate that first low-grade TA tumor, that would be very unusual to have this uh, consequences, consequence of events. Overall, this patient is, is pretty healthy. Uh, she's, she's had an apodectomy and that bladder uh, suspension. Her imaging really revealed no evidence of, uh, you know, nodal extension or nodal uh, metastases or distant metastases. Her creatinine is normal uh, on her EUA. She had um, no evidence of a pelvic mass. Dr. Schmidt, um, how would you counsel a patient like this? She now has muscle invasive disease. She has normal renal function. Um, and, and perhaps you could um, talk to us about your approach in the context of variant histology. Thank you. Yeah, this, like you said, this is a really unfortunate situation and unclear whether this truly is a progression from low grade to muscle invasive disease or just incorrect uh, characterization at the beginning and not adequate treatment of the non-muscle invasive disease before it became muscle invasive. But regardless, she's otherwise young and healthy, and I would be pretty aggressive about treating this patient. I would counsel her towards neoadjuvant cisplatin-based chemotherapy followed by radical cystectomy. And you mentioned in her imaging and on her exam under anesthesia that there's no hydronephrosis or concern for disease. It's greater than T2. 
or significantly multifocal disease, I think based on your TUR and imaging. So she technically would be a candidate for a trimodality therapy, so chemo radiation as well, but I would favor being surgically aggressive in this patient. Uh, for me, I tend to leave trimodality therapy for patients who I think are not great surgical candidates for other comorbidities or patients like your previous patient who is adamantly against a radical cystectomy. Though I know our colleagues in the UK and Europe do a lot more trimodality than we do. In her case, even though it's uh, less than 10% overall survival benefit, I would encourage neoadjuvant uh, cisplatin-based chemo, though there are patients that I would take straight to cystectomy with significant hematuria or patients who are in retention, patients who are having to have a catheter or anything like that, I would really think about going straight to surgery. Yeah, the, um, you know, and, and what about the variant histology? Yeah, absolutely. I think that, um, Variant histology also always pushes me to think about going straight to surgery because a lot of those patients are not included in the trials that we're, we're discussing. Um, and we often don't know how well they'll respond to the chemotherapy and whether it's a waste of time in their case. So one, one trial I kind of want to mention is the Pure one trial that looked at using pembrolizumab, which uh, Dr. Sundy discussed in other contexts in this space. And they actually found that it did have some benefits. So a 42% of, of, of those patients, small trial, I think only 50 patients or so at the start, went to T0 at cystectomy. And the patients who had a better response are patients who had uh, PDL1 expression in the tumor and patients who had variant histology, including uh, squamous cell features. So for a patient like this, I think there's a good level one evidence option of neoadjuvant cisplatin-based chemo, but there are a lot of other patients who would really benefit from being enrolled in clinical trials, and we should be thinking about that in all the patients that we meet with muscle invasive bladder cancer. Well, she, we did also plan for neoadjuvant uh, cisplatin-based therapy. Um, she got started on it, but had a number of adverse effects to therapy, anemia, fatigue, weakness, and ultimately only completed two cycles. So we went ahead and then proceeded to cystectomy. She opted for an ileal conduit diversion. Um, and her final pathology was, you know, she had, she had uh, extra vesicle disease. So really, again, just a, a, a really challenged, um, challenged course here. She had a, a pretty uneventful um, uh, post-operative course. She did have some ileus, so she was in the hospital a, a bit longer. Um, but overall did, did fairly well. Uh, Dr. Sunday, does she need any additional therapy? I, I would strongly consider this patient for uh, adju adjuvant systemic therapy. Um, in this specific case, your patient got neoadjuvant um, uh, gemcitabine and, and cisplatin, you know, um, not, not a full, full course, but, but some. And, and did not you know, appear to um, res respond to that. So, um, you know, in this specific case, because uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy was administered, I would look uh, to uh, guidance uh, from the Checkmate 274 clinical trial results, which strongly suggests that um, for patients uh, who got new adjuvant chemotherapy who have um, PT2, or higher stage disease, including node positive disease at cystectomy, uh, do benefit from systemic nivolumab uh, given up to a year in terms of having a better disease-free survival and having um, a longer survival free of uh, distant metastatic progression. So uh, definitely, I would reach out to one of my colleagues in geomedical oncology, um, have my patient um, you know, consult with, with the oncologist to who gave her new adjuvant therapy um, and strongly encouraged that person to consider nivolumab. Um, the uh, you know other consideration is if your patient didn't get neoadjuvant chemotherapy, um, that patient should also consider adjuvant uh, cytotoxic chemotherapy. Um, the, the 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 level of evidence supporting adjuvant systemic chemotherapy uh, um, is not as strong as adjuvant nivolumab, 
um, you know, some of these, if you look at any single trial, the sample size might be smaller or there may be low accrual. Uh, and there's, of course, the challenge of competing risks, morbidity and, and mortality that can confound some of the oncologic outcomes. But if you meta-analyze uh, several of the adjuvant chemotherapy trials, that there does suggest, to, uh, there is a suggested um, uh, survival benefit to adjuvant chemotherapy as well. So think about chemotherapy, think about immunotherapy. Uh, and, and adjuvant nivolumab specifically when new, uh, new adjuvant chemotherapy was provided initially. Dr. Cates, what about ctDNA? Should we be using that to, in this day and age to think about recurrence after cystectomy? Dr. Lee, if uh, TURBT is the most important aspect of a, of a management strategy for bladder cancer in this day and age, circulating tumor DNA is the most exciting future direction for bladder cancer. So I, I, I would say right now, if you were to ask me that question, the honest answer would be, I don't know. But why am I saying I don't know? Well, if you look at um, Invigor 10, okay, this was a trial that randomized uh, patients for adjuvant atezolizumab versus, place uh, uh, versus placebo uh, versus observation. And um, it did not meet its endpoint of, of uh, reducing disease-free survival. But in those patients that had ctDNA checked, it was uh, ctDNA was able to stratify patients who did poorly versus those did not. And those patients who were ctDNA DNA positive that had circu active circulating tumor DNA, they responded better to atezolizumab versus observation. So when, so, so the answer to my, and, and there's in vigor uh, 11, which is actually looking at the specific question of adjuvant therapy for ctDNA positive patients. So it, it is uh, becoming increasingly routine in my practice to uh, check circulating tumor DNA in high risk patients after cystectomy, those patients with uh, nodal disease, those patients with T3, T4 disease like your patient. Um, and I'm very excited about future directions of circulating DNA in the plasma, in the urine. And, and I think that it holds a lot of promise. Bladder cancer has come a long way, so exciting. Well, um, we're winding down. Uh, so I want to get to just one last dis uh, this case discussion and um, we'll, and we'll do it relatively quickly. Uh, our sixth segment is really about clinical trials and some of the obstacles that, you know, we face as, as urologists involved in trials um, and some of the, you know, some of what we would consider the role of, of the urologist. I want to come back to my patient the one who's very committed to bladder preservation, he had a couple of different opportunities to participate in clinical trials and he was excited to do it actually. Um, in the end, we, we weren't able to um, unfortunately accomplish that for him. But um, Dr. Cates, you, you talked about the bridge trial, you're, you're doing another investigate initiated study. What strategies are you, can you offer us as urologists to successfully open and complete uh, clinical trials. And even if those are small, early phase studies that we can do even at one or a few centers. Yeah, this, that's a great question, Dr. Lee. I mean, my suggestion would be to write the trial. Okay, if, if there's an idea that's compelling, uh, generate the evidence, write the trial. Um, in order to justify the resources necessary for a uh, hundred sites to open a multi-center trial that's randomized with a thousand patients, you need to start somewhere, right? So, so the, where you start is a single institution trial, perhaps three or four institutions coming together with uh, to generate data, to generate pilot data, to then justify to the larger audience that this is an important question, this has validity. So uh, that would be my suggestion, is, is to really start with an important question and start generating data. Well, and that is often the hardest part, right, is just to get started. Uh, lots of people to collaborate with. Dr. Schmidt, what, what barriers have you experienced and how have you overcome those? I think the biggest barrier is, is time. Uh, for sure, it takes a lot of time meeting with your local clinical trials office and paperwork and trainings and the endless 
emails, but I think for our patients, it, it really is worth it. And sometimes one of the challenges I think is because it takes so long, uh, it can be hard to know which trials to open. So this is where if your practice is very focused, then you may already have the relationships, whether it's with industry or with other thought leaders who will share with you what they're really excited about and that can help you. But if not, the SUOCTC, the Clinical Trial Consortium, is a great organization that includes both academic and uh, clinical-based sites, and it really partners urologic oncologists with industry to help get innovative trials off the ground. So if you're ever not sure what's a good trial to open, but you're interested in opening trials, chances are the SEO OCTC, if they're involved, it is a good trial. You should consider opening it in your space. Also, if you're a young investigator, it's a great organization to get involved with. Uh, personally, I'm very lucky at my site. I have a great coordinator, and I think that's also incredibly helpful. You have a coordinator who can help you screen patients, help your patients complete all the necessary paperwork, go through the screenings have funding available for patients to be able to make it to appointments uh, that are involved with clinical trials. That's always really helpful. Though so industry trials come with funding, which is nice, but a lot of the trials that change our practice are cooperative group trials, like SWOC trials we've all mentioned that have changed the way we treat patients, or ECOG trials like the BRIDGE trial that Dr. Cates is talking about. So having a dedicated trials nurse in clinic every week is the way you get your patients through it. And as soon as I get more funding for that, that's my goal. I also want to mention the importance of um, having a, a good representation of all patients within these trials. I think that's going to be key for us as we think about reducing health disparities over, over time, really understanding uh, really how these diseases um, really what their natural history is in a, in a variety of patient popu populations. Well, um, I wanna thank everybody for joining us this evening. Unfortunately, we're not uh, able to um, have any additional uh, Q&A, but I think we got to most of the questions in the chat. Thank you again for joining us and please enjoy the rest of your evening. <laughs>